All right. So uh, as it says on the bottom there, ham radio meets Mad Max, Boo Boo Bear, Bubba Gump. Uh, and um, it's a bit of a story of a creation, which is the vehicle and an experience, which is going from being a complete newbie to ham radio to reasonably successful contesting in a very small pond, which is FM. Uh, next slide, please. Get on the book. There we go. So a little background of myself. Um, I'll let you read. Probably the, the, the big part on this is I got a radio right on Thanksgiving 2015. I spent six months thinking, what do I want to build? You know, am I going to use ladder line or, or uh, coax? You know, what kind of antenna? What kind of transceiver? And a buddy of mine and I just wandered into uh, Summit Auto Racing, and there was a DX Engineering kiosk, and ah, oh, heck, I'm just going to buy handheld and put an end to this suffering. So after six months of thinking about it, I walk out with an HT. A couple of weeks later, after doing a whole bunch of stuff on repeaters, I decide, hey, this contesting stuff sounds like fun, and there's a contest in January. It's VHF, UHF. Looks interesting. I think I'll enter it. So then I have to build a contest station in six weeks, not knowing much of anything about amateur radio. Hey, Mike. Pause. There we go. We got it. Okay. Next. Next. Will the bean topple? Uh, no. It will not fall over. So uh, what is VHF, UHF contesting all about? Well, it's all the high bands, obviously. And like you'd imagine, uh, with this with this VHF UHF work, the higher the frequency, the more points you score because it gets to be a lot harder, and it goes all the way up to laser light. Uh, you run all modes, and propagation is kind of limited. It can be difficult to get a signal a long distance, especially with higher and higher frequencies. I would also extend that to FM, where you're taking all of your energy and spewing it over a fairly wide piece of bandwidth. Uh, and it's, you basically never get any kind of e-skipper tropo with that. It's exceptionally rare. So it's fundamentally line of sight and then diffraction over ridge lines to get your signals out there. You also score based on grid squares, um, which is a little bit different. And then every band you work in each grid square is a multiplier. So you want to have as many bands as you're allowed to have, work a station as many times as you can in that grid square, and then go on to the next grid square or work more stations. And that's how you tend to generate your points is lots of bands have contact in multiple grid squares. You also have these things called rovers and they drive all around and every time they enter a new grid square they can talk to all the same people over again and get points for that. Uh, and they're really wonderful to work. It's not that talking to a rover gets you more points but uh, they tend to get you a lot of grids. They publish where they're going to be. They tend to park on high spots uh, so you know where they're at. You point your beams at them and uh, you make points with them pretty quickly. They also can be very professional operators. So you'll knock through four bands in under a minute, maybe 30 seconds, and then you go on to the next station. It's really wonderful. It's great for the skills if you're a newbie uh, because they're so quick. Uh, it's, it's difficult to keep up with them. The other thing they'll do is they'll find a grid square corner and they'll actually work all four grids within maybe an hour or two from that grid corner. Uh, there are groups of them that will circle grid corners and that's been banned because they'd rack up millions of points uh, doing that. So there's real limitations on that because it's kind of unfair to everybody else. Uh, but these guys make all the difference in the world. Next slide, please. So categories, bands, modes, points. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. You can see all the frequencies across to the, uh, the right as you're facing it. The modes, you notice the modes all score the same. They're all one point. So it's not like you get more points for CW than you do for phone or for digital. Uh, there's power limitations. And I marked in green the categories, in this case, single operator, FM, three band, portable, and limited rover, that are fairly low bars for entry. So if you were ever interested in trying this, those are really the places to look. And I'd say that if you're looking for the smallest pond to compete in, that would be the one that I chose, which is FM. Very few people doing it, and it's, I hate to say it, kind of easy to do well. Uh, I don't always win, but uh, it's really kind of interesting that a guy that's only been on the radio for a few months within you know, six months can be <coughs> running you know, real high scores and, and winning this stuff. Uh, power levels are all over the place. 
During the gin contest, which is the one where I go work with a multi-operator station, W4IY, that is an unlimited station. And so we'll run illegal power on as many bands as they choose to bring. And interestingly, they also set up on flagpole mound in central Virginia, which is one of the spots I like to work from in the FM contest up at about 4,000 feet. Uh, great bunch of dudes. Uh, they've, all, they've been working up there for almost 30 years. And so that's my week, my, my annual immersion in, in Elmering for a solid week of 20 guys that really know their stuff. Next slide, please. So why did I choose to do this? Well, for me personally, it's more fun if you stand a chance of doing well. You know, if I decided to jump into HF, you need a lot of money, you need a lot of skill, you need the perfect location, you need a lot of experience. That's simply not gonna happen. I live in a hole. I'm surrounded by hills and McMansions, and uh, that would be absolutely no fun. Uh, so I looked at different categories to get into, and the one that struck me as maybe the one that I could actually achieve as a new guy that only owned an HT was, well, FM. Um, and there's not a lot of entrance. Uh, line of sight is king. Altitude matters a lot. I know how to do that. And it's kind of easy to put the station together. You have to pay attention to basics. You want really low loss cabling. You want a decent receiver. Uh, you want to be reasonably good at your logging, but you're not working like 100 cues an hour. You're working more like 10 or 15 an hour at best. So there's a lot of room to gain experience in that. So I decided to jump into the FM category. The one big thing was that propagation is kind of a regional equalizer. The, the people who have been winning at this category are, tend to be up in New York State. And in January, which was the chosen contest for me to take part in the first time, I knew that they couldn't get to high altitude because of snow, and I knew that I could. Because every year I've driven to the top of Flagpole Mound uh, with my jeeping buddies, got it in the bag, easy to camp up there, life is good. Next slide. So uh, the next step was to analyze scores. Uh, taking kind of an engineering approach to this, what do I have to accomplish to do well? So look at historic scores, uh, and again, I'm looking at the uh, 2016 uh, j contest in January, and figured to do in the score of the top three, I just needed 100 cues and 15 to 20 multipliers. Mm -hmm. So with that as a target, then I started analyzing locations. Next slide. Or actually looking at, looking at capabilities, I should say. <clears throat> so I used a link margin calculator to figure out just how far I'd be able to transmit with a reasonably simple station. Gain, gain, gain. The bigger the antenna, the better you're going to do. There's a limit to what you can handle, but that works both on the receive and the transmit side to improve things. So that was number one. So some nice Cushcraft beams were, were up front. Did some reasonable estimates of losses, uh, power levels limited, uh, and came out with a range on two meters of about 125 miles and 432, or in this case 446, which is the FM calling frequency of about 70 miles. Then it was time to sit down and look at radios, equipment, and possible locations to work from. Next slide. So I did an analysis then, uh, did some web searches on popular locations for rovers, because rovers like to drive to altitude. And I looked at all these locations where either rovers operated from or where I knew I could get altitude. Laid down, dozens, I won't say hundreds, but dozens of bearing lines off of these and then looked at elevation profiles to population centers to figure out which of these sites would do the best job. And as I had kind of expected from off-roading experience, Flagpole Mound was the one that really looked the best out of the group. This outer ring here represents that 125 mile range, and then the inner ring represents a 70 mile range. That let me get some estimates then on high confidence grid squares, multipliers I could reach with each band, uh, and then low confidence. And that gave me an idea that I probably could get my goal of 15 to 20 multipliers. And how can you not get 100 QSOs on FM? Every amateur in the world has an FM radio. Don't you all listen to FM all the time when you're just hanging around the house, <laughs> driving in the car? It was gonna be easy. And I got I-81 underneath me, and I know everybody driving up and down I-81 is an amateur radio operator, so all I gotta do is sit there and just pound away at him. I'm gonna win this puppy, first time out. Next slide. Um, so I had to design a system and build it. 
So I decided what radios, hardware, how to lay out my, my contest vehicle, which was my Jeep, uh, and how I was going to power the whole thing. And so now I had an idea of what I had to buy, what I had to build. Next slide. So I built the vehicle up. I took some kitchen cutting boards, uh, high density polyethylene, cut them up, made bearings out of them, uh, built my own manual rotator, uh, tore up the interior of my Jeep, took out the back seat, took the passenger seat, pulled it to the back, turned it sideways, had a place to operate, built a folding table in here, um, insulated it so I could sleep inside, because it's gonna be you know 40 mile an hour winds, single digit temperatures, wanted to be comfortable had just enough room to sleep underneath that table in the back. And uh, then I had to put a mast on there and, and get everything set up. Next slide. So I went out and I bought a whole bunch of fence post top rail, uh, slotted it, uh, put brackets on it, uh, built my uh, mast out, made a clamping bar that basically slides over and clamps down on the joints to hold it together, welded up a cross arm to hold all the antennas, and uh, got all this stuff assembled and you know lo and behold you know right before the contest i'm ready to roll everything's loaded up good to go next slide so i'm going to go to flagpole 4400 feet been up there every year for my winter ride in my jeep club well of course it snows four feet you know two weeks before the contest i hit the trail and i got chains i got 35 inch tires i got lockers i got skills i'm not afraid of this I'm going down the trail to work my way to flagpole, and what's coming up the other direction but a samurai, uh, you know, little uh, Suzuki Samurais with one-ton truck axles, 44-inch tires, <laughs> chains on all four, and there's two more behind him, and they couldn't get into flagpole. It's like, okay, this is not going to work. There's no <laughs> way I'm getting in there if these guys can't. And they were fully caged out and crazy. They had all the Flaming Skull t-shirts on. You knew they were serious. Uh, so I got stuck at about 3,600 feet with only a 120 degree field of regard, meaning I couldn't get to DC. And to get down to I-81, I had to diffract a signal uh, over a ridge line. And then to get into the Central Valley or to get past the Central Valley of the Blue Ridge, I had to go over the front range of the Blue Ridge that was co-altitude with me. Uh, this was not going to work well. However, uh, as it turned out, um, I'm going to the next slide there. The, the setup wasn't all that bad. You know, the mast folds over the top. Uh, in this case, the way you raise that mast is you stand on the bucket, you climb on the hood, you put the mast on your shoulder, and you walk it back until it's upright. Uh, and that works real good in the driveway at home and, and here <laughs> on a nice dry day. However, when I went to go tear this thing down, it had been raining and snowing and icing a little bit. And that gets real scary. You got about 120 pounds on your shoulder and you're going to step off the roof and go down about two feet onto the slick hood and try and balance this. Uh, le lesson learned that wasn't a real good idea. I didn't drop it, thank goodness. Uh, but there I have my Omni antenna in the middle, uh, a little um, uh, X30 uh, diamond, uh, a couple Kush craft beams, and happy camper. You notice all the guys go to these cross arms right here. So basically all the bending loads are right at the roof of the Jeep. But being an aerospace engineer, you know, I knew how to calculate all that stuff and make sure it wouldn't break. And you know what, it didn't. I had some good winds up there and the Jeep rocked back and forth, but the mass stayed put. Uh, next slide. So, um, number one, everything seemed to actually work okay. I did a couple 160 mile CUSOs uh, down into uh, North Carolina, which is about the only place I could see more than about 30 miles. Uh, I did talk to like 100 people. There were a bunch of hams out there. I could only convince 11 of them to submit a log sheet. And I, oh my gosh, you know, don't these people know how to do log sheets? You know, well, no, they just didn't want to do them. So, you know, I wrote up my score. I had 11 contacts in like three different grids or four grids, and I submitted that to ARRL. And then I'm kind of whining on the VHF UHF reflector about these hundred or so people I talked to, and I couldn't get them to submit logs. Well, of course, what I find out is if I would have just written them down and submitted them, they actually would have counted, and I probably would have won the bloody thing. Uh, but instead, my score was 75 instead of like, you know, 
1500 or something like that. Uh, lots of lessons learned, you know, too many nuts and bolts and fasteners, you're dropping stuff in the snow, the mast was too heavy. I carried the antennas internally disassembled. Question. <clears throat> I don't understand this about log sheets. Okay. Did you, you said you had to write something down. I mean, didn't you have all your log and you only get uh, points if they submit a log sheet? No. Yeah. I no. Replay the okay. question. The, 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 que the question was, how does the logging work in a contest? And there are two things that can happen. <clears throat> One is that when you and I make a contact, I write down your call sign and your grid square, you write down mine, and we both submit log contest logs to ARRL. And if that happens, then we both get credit for it. Now, if you don't submit a log, that means you're not competing, okay? Now, if I write down your call sign and your grid square, and I write it down correctly, you're what's called a unique, if I'm the only person that talked to you at all during the contest, I still get credit for that contact. So even if you don't submit a log sheet, the station on the other end that is competing gets credit for that score, okay? Of course, I thought everybody had to submit logs, so I talked to 111 people, and I only submit 11 of them because only 11 were gonna send logs in. So I really shot myself in the foot during the contest. Okay, next slide. So I decide to rebuild this thing, and first thing is I need a, a winch to raise the mast. I want this whole thing to fold up. I want minimum fasteners. I want the antennas carried fully assembled. So I rebuilt the whole mast structure again and got that done in getting ready for the following year's September contest. Uh, I also this time uh, met uh, somebody that has a magic antenna isolate, uh, I'm sorry, mag magic analyzer called Yasik, and uh, he came over to the house uh, in, I guess it was August, and kind of dialed in my system, getting ready for September. And boy, did we find problems and, and got them all fixed. So thank you very much for all your big effort there. Next slide. So uh, the September contest, made it to flagpole, uh, got up there, and of course, the first thing you do when you're gonna be camping out someplace, so you go, well, you dig a latrine. And this is where Boo Boo Bear comes into the game. There's bears, black bears up there. And as it turned out, every time I would go to the latrine, Boo Boo would go use it too. And that got a little weird at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where he's at. Uh, and this went on the whole weekend. Um, but the contest went wonderfully. And around two o'clock in the afternoon or so on, so yeah, <laughs> Boo Boo! <laughs> You can sit right here. Okay. So around two o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, something smells bad. Now bears smell bad. And you could tell when Boo Boo was hanging out because you could smell him. But he was smelling really awful on Sunday. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And by 7.30, it's just super rank. My lungs are burning. It hurts to breathe. And I, where the heck is this thing? And then it strikes me, that's not the bear. That's a sulfur odor, but those are one of my two big deep, one of my deep cycle batteries blowing up on me. <laughs> and it was pumping hydrogen sulfide gas into the cab of the vehicle. So you notice the hatch is open back here. I had both doors open. Um, and I had one more scheduled contact to make, and that was with uh, K8 GPR, one of the rovers. And I knew we'd run all four bands, snap, 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 and I was out of there. And so I hung out and hung out and hung out and I'm cat coughing and hacking. Finally, we make, uh, we make good comms and I like instantly shut down, dive out of the vehicle, breathe a little bit, and then start ripping the batteries out uh, and set them down. Uh, I finally shut down, pack up, and get to a hotel about three o'clock in the morning. But it turned out to have been a really good contest. Went super good. Next slide. So the results of that, and you can kind of see here on that right here inside that blue circle, and you can see the bulk of these contacts are right up and down the Central Valley uh, of the Shenandoah. A few are broken over the Front Range. And a couple of these were really cool. I had people that were butted right up against the eastern range of the Blue Ridge, two to 3,000 feet below the peak. And I'm shooting a signal about 50 miles, and it's diffracting over that. And they're getting the S9 on that, because the signal's that strong when it breaks over the ridge, uh, as opposed to being blocked. So pretty slick stuff. Actually talked to one guy up here in FN01. He was a mobile up on, I believe that's uh, 
80 or 90 highway, I think it's 80 highway up top there. Uh, that was an amazing contact up in that area. And they had a few down here, you know, right on the Virginia, uh, North Carolina border. And then one echo mite grid. You notice these grids are empty and I'm really close. That's because these are very, very mountainous and everybody lives in the valleys and I just couldn't drop a signal down there. So that was a weak area for me. And you notice there wasn't anything getting down here much into Richmond. And Richmond is difficult because it's so noisy. I have to diffract that signal over the east range of the Blue Ridge. Then it's got to go on another 100 miles and there's just not enough gas behind it to get her there. Next slide. So lessons learned, okay? Uh, before that contest, I sent out 3,000, 4,000 emails. I sent an email to every ham within about 150 miles of flagpole that had an address on QRZ. And I had two people that complained about it. Everybody else was either ignored it or said they'd be happy to get up on the air and talk to me. Uh, I think it was worth it. I had a lot of people that came back and asked if I had six meter um, and asked if I had two meter, I'm sorry, 220 as well. And um, that seemed to have been a, a significant thing to do. This was a lifesaver. When I dropped that cell on the battery, if I hadn't had this battery booster, I would have been down to about 10 volts and that would have been the end of the contest. And that battery booster sucked every amp it could out of the remaining good cells of that battery and kept me on the air that last, I'm going to guess it was six or eight hours that that kept me rolling. Uh, one thing I didn't like is I slept in the back of the Jeep. I didn't mention it, but I had lightning coming in every night. And so I was watching as best I could. I, my wife would text me because she was watching the lightning maps. Hey, there's lightning 30, 40 miles away. I could usually see it. Uh, and then I'd shut down, fold the mask down, and scoot into a tree line. And it takes about an hour to tear the thing down and set it up again. So when I shut down Saturday night, you know, I shut down around midnight, got to the tree line about 2 a.m., tried to get up at 4 a.m. then to be back on the air before there was any, you know, before I'd miss whatever ducting might show up in the early morning. Uh, so very little sleep. It was really ugly to sleep in the back of the Jeep again. Uh, so I decided I need something, some better place to sleep. And I'd fix that for later on. Next slide. So uh, in getting ready for the next January contest, I decided to do some testing. Okay, I'm gonna get a six meter antenna on there. So I bought this nice 12 foot boom, 10 foot element Cushcraft beam, uh, got it all set up, uh, you know, put it up on the Jeep, uh, drove up the flagpole with a buddy. I took my old mast that it was just guide to itself. We put the beam on that and it was really windy. We actually had some straight line winds. We were pushing about 40 miles an hour, but hey, I've had this mast up in the air in 50 mile an hour winds, no big deal. But I didn't have this monster six meter beam up there. And as I brought the mast up in the air, I got about 45 degrees, the wind grabbed it. And because it's pivoted like this, when it's leaned over, it can spin. And so the wind grabbed it and tried to spin it off the Jeep. And of course, I'm holding it and it took me with it. And uh, fortunately, the wind stopped. It didn't pull me off the rig, uh, but it was pretty scary. Uh, when I went to go set it back down, the other guy that was with me hopped up on the roof and tried to give me a hand. We had another gust that hit, was even stronger. And if he wasn't 100 pounds heavier than me, uh, we both would have gone over the side of the vehicle with the mast. So I ended up cutting down the mast um, and uh, eventually making it smaller. I also discovered the six meter used radio I got was totally deaf on six meters. It had apparently been struck by lightning. Uh, when the mast was folded down, I, put, I hooked up the antenna and had the beam horizontal with the elements vertical with the mast folded down. People heard me all over the place, but I couldn't hear them. Now, fortunately, my buddy had a six meter rig, so he heard you know, half a dozen stations, a dozen stations trying to call back to me, and I couldn't hear them at all. Well, that indicated that even with the antenna, Really, the elements were only three inches off the ground and it was pointing to the north. And, we're, and he's hearing people to the west, to the east, to the south. Uh, this is probably going to work out pretty good eventually. Next slide. So I need to build a new mast. I need to stack all these antennas up. I need to make sure that they don't sit inside their capture area. If you think about a beam antenna, it's going to have a kind of an oval shape around it, which is the area of energy that that beam captures. 
And if one antenna sits inside the capture area of another, it'll spoil the pattern. It'll distort it one way or another. So it's very important that you lay out your beams so they don't sit in each signature's capture area. For example, a two meter antenna is resonant with a six meter because, well, it's one third the wavelength, okay? Likewise, 70 centimeter and 220 will do the same thing. They're about one third off as well. Uh, so you wanna make sure you position these things correctly. Then you have to weight balance them side to side. And as I would learn later, it's kind of important to do an aerodynamic balance on top of that. That comes later, another lesson learned. But uh, Directive Systems Engineering has a fantastic article on their website in their text section on how to do the stacking. Uh, it's laid out for H-pole antennas and they'll put everything from uh, you know, five gigahertz down to six meter on a single 14 foot mast. And they'll do it without blocking each other's capture area. It's really a great paper to read if you're interested in VHF, UHF. Next slide. So I go and rebuild the mast. Now it's aluminum tubing. It's got a winch. I put a roll cage on the back half of the Jeep. I have these fold out outriggers with lines that go up to the mast. So when I raise it, the mast can't move laterally. You can see here the lines going up to the top. And when it's folded down, they're also attached. So when you raise the mast, it's very stable. The wind can't swing it. Um, and it looks exactly like a shrimp boat. So <laughs> the guy that fabbed it up said, yeah, this is, this is a shrimp boat. So that's the Bubba Gump connection on here. So we've got Bubba, we got uh, Boo Boo Bear, we got Bubba Gump, and Mad Max is just kind of the, the look of the whole vehicle. Um, I went up to a place called Reddish Knob. It's about 4,600 feet. And it's a beautiful bald knob. This is January. The first day I had a real heavy cloud layer underneath me. And I had no trouble going out 200, 235 miles on a regular basis. However, it was misting all day long. And as the temperature got lower and lower, everything started to ice. And I, this is an asphalt pad up top. There's no, there's no place to camp. It is just a knob with an asphalt pad. And then the road loops around it. Not only is there no place to camp, there's no place for privacy up there, which is the second problem, which won't go into. Um, <laughs> so I'm not camping. I'm going to go take a hotel room. And it's about an hour drive to get down out of there. So an hour to strike the system and an hour drive to a hotel. No big deal. However, when it started to ice, I knew I wouldn't be able to get down off the mountain. So as soon as it started to freeze, I had to shut down. That meant I only operated seven hours on Saturday and nine hours on Sunday. Um, 154 contacts, 31 multipliers, which is a record in the FM category, and a really darn good score, score like the second or third highest ever recorded, 6,200 points. I had people calling other people to tell them to get up on the air because they're talking to some guy on FM 200 miles away. This is really cool. People in their QTHs left the shack, jumped in the mobile rig, and drove to hilltops to make contact with me on four, uh, 446, or 448 rather, uh, because they couldn't do that from the house. I had people who were just driving in the area who talked to me and said, hey, do you need more grid squares? Where can I go? And I was telling them where to go to get on a hilltop <laughs> to give me a new multiplier. What an amazing bunch of people that were out there. I ended up with like three captive rovers that were basically asking me where they could go next to help me out. It was fantastic, hence 31 multipliers. There was a, a sad part to this though, we'll get to that in a second. Next slide. John, you only got about five more minutes. Okay, all right. So the sad part was that I lost the log sheet. I'm logging by hand and I left the log sheet behind. It was about 1,200 points that disappeared in the hotel room Saturday night. Um, the other thing that happened is that, uh, let's see, make sure that's on the next, uh, don't get to that one here. Um, actually, I lost this by 61 points. Uh, the guy up in New York that usually wins these things was on the air like 28 hours of the 33. I was on for 15. So his score was 61 points higher. It just really stank. Uh, because if I had just spent five more minutes on the air, I would have won this thing, which leads to the get N1MM, no more lost log sheets, and BIC, 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 which most of you know what that means. Uh, stay in the chair. Okay. Next slide. 
So results were pretty darn good. Uh, you know, two meter rocked uh, 20, uh, one and a quarter meter or 220 did pretty darn well. Very quiet band, propagates as well or better than two meters does, um, but just not a lot of people have it. Six meters was kind of disappointing. It didn't go that far, uh, but it made quite a difference for me. I was glad I had it. Next slide. So the scores, you know, here was the W2 EV EV out of Rochester, New York, and my score underneath it. Um, if I had just stayed sitting there another five minutes, I would have had this thing. But, Slacker. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was weak. I was weak. I was weak. <laughs> um, it was fun. That was a heck, of a, lot, a heck of a lot of fun. And to come that close to someone who's won this thing almost every year, or every contest, it was pretty thrilling. Next slide. So I decided to make some changes for September, and I make those changes, and I get in the contest, and I get to the end, and it's looking really good. This is this last September. 41 multipliers, another record, 7,300 points claimed, a record score. Uh, however, I made typing errors on N1MM. I put in O's for zeros a couple times. Uh, for some reason, the logging software I had reported the 7,300 points. ARRL said 7,800 was claimed. We're still trying to figure out why they think my claim score was higher than the one that I actually claimed. We think it has to do with my making <coughs> sideband contacts as well as FM, because my beams are at 45 degrees and I can talk to anybody on any on any on either of the two modes if I want to. Um, so we're gonna work out what happened there. Not complaining about it, it was a stomping high score nonetheless. Uh, fortunately, ARRO is not going to disqualify me. They will disqualify you if you have an error rate greater than like 2%. Uh, they have that option. And they know there was something not right here with the way this thing got logged up between what I reported and what they put in. So that's being resolved right now. Uh, but it was, it was a fun time, a real fun time. And now I can sleep in the back of the Jeep. I put the radio gear on a rack. The table folds up. You can see in that top slide, the seat actually folds up. And I got a sheet of plywood that I can lay down and sleep on top of. Nice and cozy and happy in there. Next slide. So I go to January, uh, this last January, and you know the empire of noise strikes back. I couldn't get permission to operate at Flagpole or Reddish. It's in the middle of the National Radio Quiet Zone. So I went up into central Pennsylvania, and I went to a ski resort. And the rovers go up there all the time in January and September, but nobody goes up there in, I'm sorry, they go up there all the time in June and September, but nobody goes up there in January because the parking lot is full. Well, I'm just gonna pull in the parking lot at 5 a.m. when nobody's up there and I'll set up, right? Well, what I discover is when I do my recon Friday night before the contest, it's full of noise. Ski lift motors, LED lights on the slopes, LED lights in the parking lot, noise is S7. Um, so I have to park below the top of the hill, I block everything to the north, and it feels bad. The wife rolls up Saturday afternoon, a couple hours after I was operating, and she said to me, honey, you're going to get skunked. She knew. She just looked at it, where I was, what was going on, and she was absolutely right. Uh, I had dozens of people lined up on another frequency with the controller who, were, who was handing them off to me. Uh, and. I couldn't hear any of them. They all had me 20 over S9, 40 over S9. I couldn't hear a one of them. And so out of frustration, I just flipped the switch off and okay, better luck next time. So, you know, it, I can do really well, but sometimes you, things just don't roll your way. But all the gear worked great and the antenna tunes, you also were like spot on, fantastic, thank you. Uh, next slide. So, go ahead, one more. Um, if you're interested in this, and you'll get a chance to look at this later, I imagine. You know, it's really for FM, it's all about location. Roving is a huge amount of fun. FM roving is a losing combination, by the way. Uh, you don't want to do that, but you can still have a lot of fun talking to people like the captive rovers I work, because they also worked other rovers, and they worked a handful of other stations while cruising around. Single operator portable, hiking into a mountaintop with your gear setting up, very few people enter that category. It's low power, 10 watts. If you know CW, you're in like Flint for a top score because now you can push out and get some range. So that's a great category. And probably the growing, I say the fastest growing category is single operator three band. 
It's a limited power category, but it's only six meter, two meter, and 70 centimeters. So any reasonable radio can do that for you. And it's a sideband category. Uh, you know, people have taken first place working off of beams from their QTH, Omni antennas, log periodics. Uh, it's not a real exotic category to get into. Uh, and the scores run all over the place, you know, anywhere from you know, 8,000 to 19,000, 120,000 at one point. Um, so it's, it's a fun category. A lot of folks like it. Next slide. So uh, what's unique? You know, I'd say number one to think about is FM is actually more genteel. If you've done HF or sideband contesting, people are in a big hurry. In FM, I have to give you your grid square because you're not going to know what it is if you're on FM. And I have to explain to you what an exchange is and how it works. And you have to give me that information back, you know. But you already know what my grid square is. Yes, sir, but you need to say it to me so I can write it down. Well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and you sit there and you talk. Sometimes you just talk to people for 10 minutes and kind of chat them up a little bit and explain what you're doing. Because people don't expect to make a contact at 200 miles on FM. It's really rare. Uh, don't hammer the calling frequencies. I've seen that happen where a contest station jumps on FM. CQ contest, CQ contest, da, 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 CQ contest. CQ contest, CQ contest. And everybody just goes away. <laughs> and the band gets silent for like an hour. And then everybody wonders why there's nobody on FM. <laughs> Next slide. Um, lots of little things in here. I'd say number one is stick with the basics. Gain, good antennas, clean cables, good tuning and station setup. Um, you can watch the Hepburn and DX maps. That's really more a sideband thing you rarely get. I've never seen, people, other people have, propagation with FM. Uh, and if you're going to be a rover, don't rove solo unless you're really tend into that. That's tough. Have a driver, be the operator. Uh, it can be a lot of fun, especially with the, the XYL. Next slide. Okay, so 30 second summary. Where the Jeep started, out in a rock pile, and then kind of where it ended up at was over in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's been a huge amount of fun, and um, I will say I am probably going to move over towards sideband, maybe not this September, but certainly next January. I'll be doing that and adding some more frequencies for sideband. But it's been a great introduction to contesting. Uh, it's made amateur radio a huge amount of fun. And the fact that I live in a hole and I really can't talk to anybody, uh, it's, it's a great way to actually use the radio and, and get out someplace. And I think the next slide is yeah, questions, answers. Well, sadly, we gotta go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.